All right, guys, so today I'm going to be discussing bronchodilators. And these are medications that we utilize to open up the airways, the bronchioles and the larger airways. Generally speaking, when patients develop things like asthma or bronchitis, whether it's chronic or acute, we need to find a means to bronchodilate, to open up, to open up those airways so the patient can have more patent airway and the gas exchange becomes more efficient meaning we're trying to get these airways all the little smaller airways and the major airways to bronchodilate so the gas exchange can become more efficient when patients have asthma secondary to um, allergens whether it's again acute or chronic those airways become irritated <clears throat> and the airways or the bronchioles tend to constrict or there's inflammation that's a, that occurs and the and the smooth muscles uh, become inflamed or you have an excessive amount of mucus production. So the medications that we're gonna be discussing today in one way or another cause or make those blood vessels, to, I'm sorry, those bronchioles, those airways to dilate and therefore enhance respirations, right? So the first type of drug that we're gonna be discussing are known as beta adrenergic agonist, okay? Now, what are beta, what is beta and what is agonist? Well, first of all, beta is a receptor. A receptor is an organelle on the cell membrane of the smooth muscles that we're going to be discussing because that's what that's what's inside the airway right here right smooth muscles and they're receptive to a variety of neurotransmitters hormones chemicals in this particular case beta adrenergic agonists are sensitive to adrenaline to catecholamines to epinephrine norepinephrine right and so when they're stimulated by that catecholamine it activates the fight or flight these medications enhance that's where the word agonist comes into play. Agonist means in favor of, it enhances a specific action. And these receptors on the smooth, on the cell membranes of the smooth muscles of the airways, they enhance the activation of your catecholamines, of your adrenaline. So some of these drugs you probably know as albuterol. Okay, you probably know as levalbuterol. Okay, and we even have some medications known as terbutane. Okay, now these are the most common medications that you're going to be hearing when it comes to your beta adrenergic agonist. These medications enhance the sympathomimetic activity. This is very important because most of our drugs that we give patients, what we do is we try to activate a mechanism that will give us a therapeutic effect that's going to be needed to resolve the issue. So in this particular case, the issue is bronchodilation. Okay, In some way or another, the airways are constricting and we need to open them up. So we give medications that enhance the fight or flight mechanism. And this is going to give you your side effects. When you think of these medications, think of what's the medication doing? What system is it activating? What's it carrying out so it can provide a therapeutic effect in order for the patient to, to have airway patency? So um, when we talk about beta agonists, think of sympathomimetics. What happens when your fight or flight system is activated? You develop tachycardia. You develop palpitations. You develop peripheral vasoconstriction, which is going to increase your blood pressure. Now, this is very important for you guys to understand because when we're talking about beta agonists, such as albuterol, well, the patient may develop hypertension secondary to the medication. So if your patient already has hypertension, you can't be giving them these medications because it's going to exacerbate, cause a hypertensive crisis, or just cause worsening hypertension, which is going to cause a potential CVA, a stroke, or an MI, a heart attack, or some other type of issue with the blood vessels becoming damaged, like aneurysms. So please keep in mind, these medications, because they're activating the fight or flight system, as a side effect, they cause hypertension. So do not give them to patients who already have existing hypertension as this medication may exacerbate the issues. Keep in mind that um, these medications are given as, inhal as inhalers um, and primarily given to treat acute symptoms. Now, let's talk about the second classification of bronchodilators. Remember, the goal is to open up those airways in one way or another. So we have P, D, E, inhibitors, okay? And P, D, E inhibitor stands for um, phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Now, phosphodiesterase is a chemical sequence that occurs inside the cells when your cells utilize what we call cellular respiration. You guys remember the Krebs cycle? You guys remember ATP, CAMP, all that stuff? Well, 
this is how your cells stimulate or activate energy. That's how they utilize sugars and oxygen for the activation of energy. Well, this PDE, this phosphodiesterase inhibitor, it blocks a specific chain of that cycle, which prevents the cells from maximizing its utilization for the contraction or the stimulation of the smooth muscles in the airways. And so when they inhibit that function, well, then the smooth muscles relax. Some of the, and they, they, you have bronchodilation. Again, both medications have different mechanisms of action, but they provide the same therapeutic effect of bronchodilation, okay? Now, the medication that I'm gonna be discussing for this one is gonna be your theophylline. Okay, theophylline or um, amino, uh, aminophylline. Um, these medications can be given IV. We have to be careful because they have a therapeutic range of 10 to 20. And that's what we have to do weekly lab values to ensure that the patient is not developing any toxicity. Okay. So the third type of medication we'll be discussing tonight is going to be your anticholinergics. Okay. And some of the anticholinergics that we're going to be discussing are known as So it's going to be epitropium and teotropium. These medications are known as anticholinergics. A couple things you guys have to know about anticholinergics. First of all, anticholinergics block a neurotransmitter known as acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is important because it deals with the activation of muscles, right? So when we give anticholinergics, they block the stimulation of, of muscles, of smooth muscles in the airways. But those are not the only ones that are being affected. You have a variety of these um, anticholiner uh, of these cholinergic receptors all over the body, right? So when you give anticholinergics, ipotropium or teotropium, just keep in mind, folks, that they're going to relax the smooth muscle activity. This is going to cause a therapeutic effect of relaxation, which is going to eventually bronchodilate, which is the therapeutic effect that we want, right? But the side effects are significant because the smooth muscles that we're talking about, they have mucous membranes and submucosal membranes, and they produce mucus. And so as a side effect, it also affects the production of mucus, and it decreases the mucus production. That's why these medications, anticholinergics, they dry you up. And when they dry you up, they cause dry mouth. They may cause urinary retention. They may cause constipation because all the mucous membranes in the body are becoming dried up. And so you have to understand the side effects and the potential elements that you must report or the contraindications. For instance, if a patient has um, urinary retention, you don't want to give them these drugs because these drugs are going to exacerbate the drying of the mucous membranes. It's gonna to contribute to more or furthermore urinary retention. And the same idea goes with constipation. Keep in mind that these medications, anticholinergics, they affect the smooth muscles. Well, you have smooth muscles inside the eyeballs. And what ends up happening is you have the, um, you have the, uh, I can't think of it right now, but you have these smooth muscles of the eyes that contract and relax that allow for the movement of aqueous humor. And what I'm talking about is the ciliary body. And the ciliary body is a smooth muscle that again facilitates the mobilization of that aqueous humor in and out of the anterior chamber to the vitreous humor and through the, um, the, the pupil of the, of the eyeball. And that cycle continues. When you give these medications, those muscles are affected and it closes the gap, the canal of Schlem where that fluid is supposed to be released least and it increases the intraocular pressure so what i was saying about earlier was the ciliary body so keep in mind anticholinergics increase intraocular pressure so they're going to be contraindicated for patients who have glaucoma that's going to be the main takeaway from this type of drug okay let me erase something so i can discuss the last classification that we'll be discussing tonight The four classification of bronchodilators that we're going to be discussing tonight are going to be your corticosteroids. Okay. 
Now, your corticosteroid medication include things like fluticasone, and then your budesonide. We have other medications like uh, cyclosod cyclosodine, but these medications are corticosteroids. They're powerful anti-inflammatory drugs. Now, why are we giving these as anti as bronchodilators? Well, because these medications decrease the inflammation of the airways, such as when you're having uh, when you're having issues such as uh, bronchitis or asthma. Okay, and so that's how these medications effectively um, decrease the inflammation, hence increase the opening or the patency of the airways, and thus providing bronchodilation. Keep in mind that these drugs can cause candidiasis, okay, or what you guys know as thrush. So because of this particular purpose, uh, because of this particular principle, understand that the patient will be educated to rinse and spit uh, a few times a week so we can decrease the likelihood of the patient developing these issues. Also keep in mind that we always give um, bronchodilators like albuterol and bronchodilators like corticosteroids, powerful anti-inflammatory drugs, in conjunction with one another to help patients regulate their, bronchodilator, their bronchial issues such as asthma and bronchitis. So you get questions on implants like, well, which one do you give first? You know, do you give the bronchodilator first, which is albuterol, or do you give the corticosteroid first? Always want to give the um, albuterol first, the medication that causes um, the, bronchi the bronchioles to open because of the beta agonist action. Because before we get the anti-inflammatory drugs in there, we want to open up those airways, create patency, and then you want to go ahead and give the corticosteroid inhaler so you can decrease the inflammation. Remember to rinse the mouth a few times a week so you can prevent the likelihood of developing candidiasis. One more thing that I want to discuss that I kind of forgot to mention a little bit while, a while ago. Well, actually, no, I did talk about it. So let me ask you guys a question real quick. If we're taking beta adrenergic agonists, right? Medications that enhance the fight or flight mechanism. What, what conditions are those medications that we just discussed, beta, ag beta agonists, what conditions are going to contraindicate the administration of that drug? Hmm? If you guys said uh, patients with hypertension, you guys are correct because when a patient's taking the medications that are beta agonist, you want to not give it to them when they have hypertension because it's going to peripherally vasoconstrict and exacerbate the blood pressure. Okay, so I hope this made sense, guys. Please follow me and subscribe on Learn NCLEX now on YouTube, and please follow me on Learn NCLEX now on Instagram, um, previously NCLEX.solved, and uh, please follow me on TikTok as well. I post videos there as well. Uh, thank you very much.